The main sponsor of the 2014 Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame is Subaru of New England. You caught my eye, I say hello. You take me where I want to go. Hey! Ladies and gentlemen, now that everyone has, or just about, has uh, main course in front of them, we'd like to get the program started. Welcome once again to the 8th Annual uh, Induction Ceremony of the Massachusetts Broadcasters. And I must say, this is really cool. We have, for the first time, everyone from age 19 months to 100 in the room. And that's a nice span. Massachusetts can be very proud of the broadcasters uh, of all generations here and future broadcasters. In any event, uh, we'd like to thank the supporters, especially the Mass Broadcasters Association, and thank you to uh, one individual with a good first name, Jordan Walton. Is Jordan here? Jordan, thank you so much for your valued support of this organization, and we have a great unity and a great fellowship. I'd also like to recognize one of the Hall of Fame's founding members. He's a terrific guy, as is everybody from the institution, from the uh, organization, Mass Associate. College, university, pardon me. Please welcome Dr. Charles Wall, president of Mass Community College, Massasoit. Thank you, Charlie. And thanks to all of your fine support and all your great people, the best. And now uh, our new president of the Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame has a few words before we get on with the induction ceremonies. Please welcome a great guy, Don Kelly. Thanks, Jordan, and thanks everyone for showing up today. We appreciate it. I'd like to take a moment right now to thank a lot of the hardworking board members of the Hall of Fame, especially our Vice President Lynn Osborne and our Secretary Joan Greenberg. A lot of work goes into putting this on. Charlie Wall and I would also like to honor two of the original members of the Broadcasters Hall of Fame. First, a founding member who spent seven years on the board as our website specialist and who retired last year, Alan Chapman. Alan? Come on. Thank you. This just proves the old adage, adage, you can fool all the people some of the time. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Thank Thank you. you. And also, a founding member and the president for the first seven years of the Mass Broadcasters Hall of Fame, who has been a big help to me in trying to muddle through this first year as president, Art Singer. Uh, just, just a few quick words here. Uh, seven years ago at our very first Hall of Fame induction, I had the great pleasure of introducing Jess Kane and giving him his plaque. And as I read the inscription to the audience, Les Jess put his hand on my shoulder and stage whispered to me, you spelled my name wrong. <laughs> um, well, it turned out that wasn't the case. It was just Jess being Jess but it certainly gave me a start. So I'm looking at my certificate and it's spelled correctly. So thank you very much. Uh, just very quickly, I appreciate this recognition. I will always be indebted to Charlie Wall and Alan Chapman for asking me to take on the presidency when we were getting started. It's been a highlight of my career 
in broadcasting, and I thank you all very much. Thanks, Art. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, one additional note, by the way, we'd like to uh, send out a little salute to the folks at WBZ-FM who won a Marconi Award last night at the NAB. All you CBS folks here, congratulations. They're not easy to win. Many people have asked how we decide who gets into the Hall of Fame, so I thought I'd explain it a little bit for you. We have a nominating committee on the board of the Hall of Fame, which gets together, and we had an open nomination period last March for the whole month, and anybody on the board, anybody in the industry, the general public could go on the website and nominate anybody who they thought had a Hall of Fame-worthy broadcasting career, at least partially in Massachusetts. So we got together and reviewed 300 names, and that required research because some of the listeners who nominated people gave no details, and we had to look it up and find out where they worked and how long they worked and what they did that was special and all that. Of the 300, we wound up inducting 12. That's 4%. That's like getting into Harvard. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's the way that works. And for the people who are being inducted today as one of the 4%, congratulations to all of you. And uh, we're here to honor and continue the tradition and respect the history of Massachusetts broadcasting. And you should all be congratulated. Jordan? Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, Don. I wanted to mention just a couple of other names. Uh, one gentleman who couldn't be here today, he's recuperating from knee surgery, Ken Carter, who was nominated and won last year, and Gary Armstrong, who I had uh, dinner with the other night, sends his regards. There were so many others that we couldn't get to. Thanks to Emerson College, by the way, the great kids and great team. I really appreciate that. All right, we're about to begin. And I promised Peter Casey and my team that they'd be back for the afternoon drive time news block. So we're going to move this thing along and have a lot of fun. <laughs> Our first presenter is a legendary program director. I had the honor of working for him when I was a wee lad. But he's one of the best in the business. And he knows his stuff. And he's such a great guy. WRKO, WZOU, Oldies uh, 103, just on and on. Please welcome Harry Bud Nelson. <laughs> I want to thank you, Don, for that assistance. I've only had, I only had like three or four shots with uh, Dan Justin for old time's sake before I got up here. So I'm in good shape. I want to say Arnie, woo, woo. <laughs> it's truly great to be back here in Boston and see a lot of my old friends that I haven't seen in a long time. I programmed here for years, and it's just wonderful to see these smiling faces, and it's great to be back here in Boston and speak on behalf of my friend Mike Adams, who I have known for 41 years. Believe it or not, 41 years. And I know that Mike joins me today in saying congratulations to the other inductees, uh, Bruce Swagler, who was uh, actually our neighbor out in Natick when Mike and I moved here in 1973. Bruce sort of found himself residing in the middle of a bunch of crazy, uh, intoxicated disc jockeys, and he's trying to start a TV career at the time, and he's going, this cannot be good for my reputation. <laughs> also, I'd like to congratulate our friend John Garabedian, uh, Richie Balsbaugh, creator of Kiss 108, along with Sonny Joe White, and uh, Mr. Dave O'Gara, who had a wonderful career in Worcester of 46 years. <laughs> also, uh, we'd like to recognize all the folks that are here today from CBS and Clear Channel, and Intercom and uh, all of my friends at Greater Media, who I worked with for a number of years. Uh, as a matter of fact, while I'm up here today, uh, Greater Media's magic has uh, gone to their Christmas format to catch, <laughs> to, to catch all you uh, programmers here off guard. And aren't you kind of surprised they did it so late this year? <laughs> it's great to be here uh, speaking on behalf of Mike Adams. 
Uh, Mike has always been one of those guys that uh, has really been a, a wonderful to everyone. You uh, never heard a, a bad thing about Mike Adams with the uh, possible exception of today. <laughs> we uh, met in the studios at WRKO when we were both baby DJs back in 73. Uh, and we both had kind of that wild-eyed look on our face like, I don't think that we're going to make it through this first week. I think both of us thought that uh, it was the Big 68 WRKO, and we thought that the Big 68 meant the number of minutes that we would last in major market radio. Uh, I'm going to introduce Mike officially in just a second, but I would like, uh, before I do that, I would like he and Jan to come up here with me for just a second. Uh, I'm going to need your uh, support when I say this, so come on up. Come on. Where do you want me? One on, one on each one side. On, oh, I'll go on the other side. Then. You go over there. <laughs> there we go. I just want to tell you that this friendship all of this time has just been absolutely wonderful. These are two of the greatest people that I have ever known. They were with me in my illness two or three years ago. Uh, we have spent a lot of holidays together, Christmases, Thanksgivings. Uh, over the years, we've gone to the beach together and seen, I guess, but a hell of a lot of bad movies together, too. <laughs> so... Uh, as we head into this next phase of our life, you've always been there for me, and uh, I hope I will be able to do the same. Same. I love you very much, and thank you. Love you, too. Love you. Mm, love you. All right, before we uh, introduce Mr. Excitement here, we have, I think we have a little uh, retrospective on Mike's career. So uh, now let's roll that beautiful uh, Mike Adams Beantown footage. Hi, I'm the exciting one, Mike Adams, Morning Magic, along with Amanda Giles and Gabe Vernon. And every day we get your morning started the right way. I'll have the Morning Magic poll and something interesting. And I'll have concise news, weather, and traffic. But wait, there's more. Ever wish you could tell a radio station which songs you'd like to hear and which ones you don't want to hear? Well, you can right now. Click on the Magic Music Test and let us know. There are no wrong answers. Don't forget, every morning you have a chance to win a pair of bedtime magic jammies. So set your clock radio to 106.7. Wake up with morning magic. Magic 106.7. And I hope all of you guys enjoy the Christmas music on the way home. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and my privilege to present to you one of the greatest talents in the history of Boston radio and one of the greatest talents ever in top 40 radio and the newest member of the Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Would you please welcome Mr. Excitement, the exciting Mike Adams. Wow, now, this is exciting. And Harry, <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, I'll try and make this a couple of 30s and maybe a 15, Jordan, if that's okay. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, members of the uh, Board Hall of Fame for this honor. To me, it's unbelievable, and maybe you out there, it's pretty unbelievable, too. What is he doing up there? Well, I'm very grateful. I'll tell you that, very appreciative, and I'll take it. Uh, I want to thank my many friends and coworkers who are here today. Uh, some I've worked with recently and others I worked with some 40 years ago. It is a real honor to have, uh, have them here with me today. And I especially want to thank my wife, Jan, Mrs. Excitement. Uh, always there, always supportive. And uh, whenever I got hired someplace, they got us both. They got us both. And they always liked her better. So <laughs> I want to thank Harry Bud Nelson for the memories that he shared, the moments. And, you know, Harry and I have worked together uh, a long, long time at uh, WRKO, WZOU, WODS, WBCS. And due to Harry's programming expertise, every one of those stations has either changed call letters, format, or both. <laughs> nice, you. nice going, Harry. It's a wonder both of us are here today. I'm part of why you're so successful. 
Now, I, I understand the, the award is there's no monetary value to it, so we can split that if it's okay with you, Eric. All right. Now, you, when you have a chance like this to get up and make a few remarks, and you think, well, something funny would be nice. But a long time ago, uh, Tom Doyle and I were on the air together, and he told me something very important. And he says, Mike, always remember, remember this. Tom Doyle, very, very funny. Mike Adams, not funny. <laughs> so Tom, thanks for that great advice. Tom, very funny Doyle. It is an honor to be uh, inducted into the Mass Broadcasters Hall of Fame, especially when you start your career on the radio in Daytona Beach, Florida as Sid the Surf. Yeah. <laughs> Sid the Surf. Uh, I would have never imagined I have a lifelong career in radio and uh, have the opportunity to work and live in a city that I, I love so much. And it was uh, back in 1973, this won't be a long travel log, but uh, Harry Nelson and J.J. Wright, J.J. is here today, uh, and we all began to work at RKO within about two, three weeks of each other, and uh, worked with the legendary Dale Dorman, and that was quite the ride. I wish Dale could be here today. My years with RKO General, CBS, Greater Media, incredible, all of the great broadcasting companies, and it was really, I stole this from somebody, I think it was Jack Casey, it was the second golden age of radio, it really was. To be on the air in Boston at that time, the great promotions, the great contest, uh, the things we did was uh, really incredible. Uh, you got to hang out with the bands, with celebrities. As, as a matter of fact, if it weren't for radio, I would never have met Elvis, probably not have met Paul McCartney. I got to meet Joan Rivers, and I'll never forget what she said. I can't repeat it today, but I'll never forget what she said. <laughs> and uh, I think most importantly, though, uh, I don't know if how many of you know this or even care, but I was the sixth Bay City Roller. It said so in 16 Magazine. And, and now that I'm retired, we're going to put a, a tour back together, and I hope you check it out on my Facebook page soon. <laughs> Finest hour. I'm trying to think. Was it all the coffee breaks that we did at Magic every Friday for like 17 years? But then I thought, you know what? Harry and I uh, were on a, uh, a bumper sticker run for WZOU. It was a summer morning, Southeast Expressway. We're in the zoo van. And you just had to pull over somebody if they were listening and give them $1,000. Easy enough. So we find a car right away, ZLU bumper sticker on the back. We do the call in, mention the, we describe the car, tell them where we are, pull behind the guy, and he doesn't pull over. So we follow him, follow him. Finally, Harry's in the van. He, goes, he starts blinking and flashing the lights, flashing the lights. And we go, what's the matter with this guy? And then we realize we're part of a funeral procession. So... <laughs> Okay, maybe not the finest hour, but what we remember. Uh, you know, when baseball players get inducted to the Hall of Fame, they, get to, they, they take the cap and they wear the, the cap that, uh, on, for the team that got them there. And if I had to choose a cap to wear today, uh, no doubt about it in my mind, it would be Magic 106.7. Uh, <laughs> it was just, just the best. Uh, Don Kelly said he thought I'd be a good fit for Morning Magic, and I thought, are you kidding? I work with Tom Doyle. Have you heard us? <laughs> and uh, lucky for me, Don was right. So uh, I want to thank Don Kelly. I want to thank Magic, and I want to especially thank Greater Media. Give me the chance to work with some incredible people, very talented and nice people, people you'd like to call your friends uh, years and years later. Finally, uh, being in inducted into the Mass Broadcasters Hall of Fame is such an honor. Thank you very much. And for all of you who are here today, and love this business we call radio, I hope you'll get your day too, because it really is pretty magical standing up here. Thank you very much. Mike Adams' hair care products will be available in the hall. <laughs> Women and men. Jesus Christ, it doesn't change. Our next presenter is Hall of Fame inductee, Natalie Jacobson. Is he the funniest guy in the room? Jordan, you're amazing. Tom Doyle is. <laughs> okay, Tom, well. I have to tell you, I am so excited to have been asked to do this, to present this award to Leo today. I'm proud, I'm honored, and just thrilled. In two minutes, nobody could do justice to Dr. Leo Baranek, but then 
TV news people are used to being asked to tell the story of World War II in a minute 30, so I'll do my best. Dr. Leo Baranek is an extraordinary person. He is one of the world's preeminent scientists who went on to lead a group of wide-eyed idealists to create what the New York Times called the best television station in America. And to this day, Leo is an active citizen and a generous philanthropist, just last week donating a Steinway grand piano to the Museum of Fine Arts. All of this as he celebrates his 100th birthday on Monday. <laughs> I know Dr. Leo Baranek as president of Boston Broadcasters Incorporated, a group of people who wanted to create a great television station and who spent some nine years battling for the license to operate Channel 5. Pie in the sky, they said. No one can produce all of that original programming that BBI is promising. It just cannot be done. Well, while Leo would certainly be the first to credit other people, including our founding treasurer, Billy Porvo, who is here with us today, the fact is that Dr. Baranek was the man at the helm. He set the tone. The first smart thing they did was to hire Bob Bennett as the founding general manager. His mission from the BBI board of directors, make this the best television station in America, whatever it takes. It took money. But even more, it took an attitude. Explore, be innovative, be committed. Dr. Branick brought his intelligence, his imagination, and his work ethic to WCVB. All of us who worked there understood there were really no rules, only a mission. Know this community and dedicate your efforts to serving it. It was a magical time for people like me this was a place where you couldn't wait to get to work every day, a place where failure was treated as a lesson from which to learn. No idea was too big or too small. The phrase, think outside the box, wasn't invented yet, but that was the mantra. And it began in the president's office, whose door was never closed. The result was that everyone was allowed to be the best they could be, and those promises under the stewardship of Dr. Leo Baranek, we not only met them, but surpassed them by far. Perhaps that's why Paula Camera nominated Leo Baranek for this award. I was among the small group of people huddled in the newsroom on the eve of March 19, 1972. The sign on would come at 3 a.m. We were all excited, we were nervous, anxious. And into the newsroom comes Dr. Leo Baranek, his arms filled with champagne from the party that the board was having down the hall. We knew right then that our president was a nice guy. So Dr. Baranek, I am as proud today as I was on March 19th, 1972 to have been part of your team. A great experiment that proved doing the right thing for the community was good journalism, good business, and good citizenship. Please watch this video. Well, welcome. I share our chairman of the board's welcome to you. WCVB is a television happening. We have a superb station and a top flight staff. Starting immediately, we will broadcast more locally produced television programs than any other network affiliated station in this area. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Leo Baranek. your Channel 5 team right there for you. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell any jokes. I'm not good at that at my age. But I'm glad to be here with all of you. It's a great honor for me to be introduced into this Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame. 
and I thank the committee for considering me, and I understand for Paul for nominating me. Now, I served as president and chairman of Boston Broadcasters, and we were the owners and operators of WCVB-TV from 1963 until its sale in 1982. WCVB is a successor to the Herald Traveler Station, then called WHDH, and the FCC had invited new applicants for the license, and we made our application in 1963. Our goal was to bring better television to Boston, and we promised 24-hour on-air operation, more in-depth and longer coverage of news and public affairs, and more local programming than any other television station in this country and regular in-depth editorials. Now, our principal competitor for this was WHDH. Now, after a year of hearings, an appointed examiner ruled against us, saying, quotes, BBI's promises are permeated by an exuberance which makes one doubtful of their fulfillment. But the FCC reversed that. And we went on the air then Sunday, March 19th, 1972. And let me give you our figures. Our programs included 15 news hours a week. Local produced non-news programming amounted to 37 hours a week. And we broadcasted editorials five nights a week. The New York Times in 1981, as somebody else has already said, had the, the, the one page talking about us with the headline, some say this is America's best television station. Now it's always been my principle to employ only the most competent people in the field. Bill Purvu, who is here today, and I managed to get Robert Bennett to leave a highly successful Channel 5 station in New York and to be our general manager. And then Bennett and I hired the finest anchor people, which included the top, Natalie Jacobson. And of course, there were others like the late Chuck Curtis. And we sold Channel 5 in 1982. And we sold Channel 5 in 1982 because many of our stockholders were getting old and we had no way of purchasing their stock in case of death. It was a heartbreaking for me to walk away from this highly successful operation, and I thank you for listening. Congratulations, Leo. I'll, I'll escort you down, okay? Congratulations. Our next presenter, sitting off to my right, is a former uh, Hall of Famer and one of Boston's most prolific and wonderful morning men, Matt Siegel. Matt. How good does he look at 100? I like to look that good now. <laughs> Kidding me? Uh, two years ago, I stood at this uh, podium and accepted uh, my induction into the Hall of Fame, and so I feel thrilled two years later to be able to pay it forward, as it were, and to make it even better, I get to bring in to the Hall of Fame the man who, well, he gave me my big break. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. He's the man that hired me. The man is a genius. He hired me. That should be reason enough to be in the Hall of Fame. Richie Balsba created KISS 108, uh, and he was like no one else. Other radio stations were giving out movie passes. He gave out thousands of dollars. We gave out a BMW. We gave away a Mercedes. We gave away a house. Who does that? Thank God he um, was able to save a lot of money in my original salary back in 1981, which enabled... Um, 
He put together the Kiss, Kiss concert, which is now legendary. This is a true story. Don Law, one of the most recognizable empresarios in the entire country, this is true, said to Rich, this cannot be done. You cannot have 15 or 20 major acts on one stage. It's undoable. Rich said, I'm doing it anyway, and I'm going to give all the money to charity. And Murray Feingold, who's going to be honored here in a few moments, will tell you that over the last 30 some odd years, Kiss 108 has given the Genesis Fund over a million dollars. <throat> Richie and I uh, started working together in 1981, and Due to the wonder of the statute of limitations having passed, I could tell you some stories <laughs> from the 80s. Unfortunately, they're not suitable for a luncheon. They are more suitable for a parole hearing. <laughs> I will tell you a little piece, just one line from one story. Rich, what are we going to do? We can't leave him here. He, I, I would have nothing if it weren't for him. I mean, I, I mean, I would have been better paid in the early years working for another station, but I don't think that I ever would be where I am today with him. I love the big guy. Ladies and gentlemen, Richie Ballsbach. Thanks very much, Matt. You're right. I was smart to hire you. Um, I have to admit, I was a little bit worried there when they went from Mike Adams to Leo Baranek. I figured they had a change of heart and they, they, they dusted me off the menu. But uh, they just, I guess they just changed up the lineup. Um, I always believed in the old adage, I'd rather be lucky than smart. And it was luck that got me a long way. I uh, graduated from college from Penn State and my first job was with Scott Paper Company, co company selling toilet paper. Um, it really was. And I used to tell people, I'm a great salesman. I can sell toilet paper, paper. I can sell anything. And I was reminded that pretty much everybody needs toilet paper, so it didn't make me such a great salesman, actually. <laughs> <clears throat> but it was with Scott Paper Company that I got promoted and transferred to Boston. And that was my first bit of luck. Uh, as soon as I came to Boston, I'll never forget, I got, I got into Logan Airport. I took a cab into Commonwealth Avenue. I got out of the cab and I knew I was home. I knew it's where I wanted to live. So my first bit of luck was coming to Boston. My second bit of luck was I met a, a, a fellow named Scott Knight and they owned the Knight Quality Group stations and they, were having, they happened to be uh, hiring a salesman, a spot radio salesman. So I interviewed, got the job, and started in 1972 selling spot radio for the Knight Quality stations. So that was my second bit of luck. So this went on for six years. I loved the business. I used to, with Scott Paper Company, go in the basements of factories and office buildings and meet with purchasing agents. And all of a sudden, I was going to these great advertising agencies, meeting with the media departments and the ad execs. And it was like I died and went to heaven. Anyway, in the late 70s, I got a call out of left field from this wacky congressman from Hawaii named Cecil Heftel. And I don't know how or why he found me, but he said, kid, he said, I've heard about you, I want you to take over this, I'm buying a radio station in Boston, and I want you to run it. So I was all excited, I said, well, which one? He said, WBCN. I said, pretty cool. So even though I thought that I was maybe underqualified because I had never run a radio station, I accepted the job, resigned from night stations, and I got a call the next day from the congressman saying that the deal had fallen through. <laughs> so I said, oh crap, here we go. And what happened was, uh, he said, don't worry, he says, I'm going to buy another station. So he winds up buying WWEL in Wellington Circle in Medford, Mass. I, I never even heard of it, so I thought my life was doomed. I said, oh my God. 
I, I, I left this, this wonderful job to take over BCN, and now all of a sudden I have a radio station I never heard of. But one of the redeeming things about it was that I was able to do whatever I wanted to with the format. So on January 15th of 1979, in the middle of the night, we went from Love Letters in the Sand to Disco Inferno. And we went from beautiful music to disco. Now that was all great too, except that I didn't know that disco was gonna die a year later, which good decision made bad. But luckily, and, and, and I, I, this is another piece of good luck, I had Arnie Woo Woo Ginsburg, I had Sonny Joe White, I had a lot of wonderful people around me, and we were able to make a transition from disco to top 40. And one of the reasons that that transition was made so seamlessly was, as Matt Siegel said, the brilliant move I made in hiring Matt Siegel. Uh, so Matt, Matt came on to do mornings, and the radio station prospered and, and, and just did well. And obviously, even to this day, Kiss is a giant in the market. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. I actually listened when I was told that I had three minutes. So I, uh, I and, and I'm not a programmer or an on-air personality, but I will tell you that I can't believe that a programmer, if it was two 60-second spots, would ever let a, a, a personality go over uh, on that. I mean, it's usually like, come on, 60 seconds is over. But I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank you for honoring me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Class act, well done, thank you, congratulations, Richie. We have uh, folks who are with us and folks whose memories we honor. Our next presenter is here to honor one such person, such a very well-known person. Please welcome Gene Hopkins of WGBH-TV. Gene, would you come forward, please? Thank you, Jordan. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of WGBH and Julie Child. It all started with a book tour. It was 1961, and Julia Child arrived at WGBH's Channel 2 studios to appear on the book review show I've Been Reading. In one hand was a copy of her first cookbook, Mastering the Art of French Cooking. And in the other hand was a whisk, so she could demonstrate for viewers just how to properly beat egg whites. The expertise, but mostly the charm, of this tall Cambridge housewife with a very distinctive voice were immediately apparent. Under the creative eye of producer Russ Morash, WGBH invented a cooking show, and the French chef was born. Not only did the program launch Julia on the path to become America's first celebrity chef, it launched a whole new genre in television. Julia became a culinary icon and public television's first, most enduring, and most endearing star. Her no-nonsense, you-can-do-it approach inspired a generation of chefs, as well as a generation of home cooks who were eager to add a little French twist to their own family meals. Together, Julia and WGBH revolutionized cooking in America and it's one of our proudest achievements. Julia's Cambridge Kitchen, where she once made me a tuna sandwich, well, okay, it was more like tuna niçoise, but you know, it was simple. Her kitchen is now in the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. She was lovingly parodied on everything from Sesame Street to Saturday Night Live, and she won national and international honors. But Julia was not about fame. She would be most pleased with the recognition here at home with her peers in Massachusetts broadcasting. Julia Child's unique brand of culinary know-how continues to whet the nation's appetite. Here is a taste of Julia to remind us why. Bon appetit. Flour, water, Salt, yeast, and a flit gun. That's all you need to make your own French bread. Today, on The French Chef. And it's going to 
to take about 25 minutes in all, so set your timer. And then at minute two, open the oven door, <laughs> flick gun in hand, woof, wink, woof. Close the oven door. And then at minute four, open the oven door, <laughs> flip, flip, woof. So that's all for today on The French Chef. This is Julia Child. Bon appétit. Cooking made easy. And here to accept the award in honor and in memory of Julia is Chaz Norton, who worked with her for many years on The French Chef. Chaz? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, it's hard to channel a person with such wonderful spirit and uh, kind of uh, a special feeling, but I think I have a few remarks that I'd like to say, and that starts with the fact that Julia was always a regular person. She wasn't a star. She was the first of the culinary stars, but she was just the regular person who lived with her husband, Paul, and tried to do a job and do it well. And she worked um, as part of a team, and she was a team member, not a sort of star person. And I think the most important thing, and I remember that she was always pleasant, she was always humble, but she was really focused on her job in a way that uh, was always impressive. And the humor that she brought to that clip was the kind of humor that she had on and off the screen, but she was always a pleasant person who treated everyone the same. I think the, the fact that she was a pioneer of kind of the cooking genre uh, is something that we forget, that she was a regular person who was born in the first part of the century, and she would be considered, were she standing here today, perhaps a tiny bit old-fashioned. But I think I relish that kind of old-fashionedness and that straightforwardness that she had. Um, one thing I remember uh, in particular, we were on the floor. We used to have um, a rehearsal that we had an invited audience for. And um, between the rehearsal and the taping, um, the programming manager came in and said, Julia, I need to talk to you. But he didn't say it privately. He said it sort of across the, the studio. And she said, yes, what is it? And he said, I'm changing your night and your time slot to, I forgot, it was maybe 9 o'clock on a Tuesday night. She said, you can't do that because that conflicts with the FBI. And I and my friends watch the FBI. <laughs> that is unacceptable. So she was a person who had a reality factor based on what she liked, what her friends liked and she had a great deal of common sense. So in accepting this, I know that she would uh, give a shout out to the people who helped her, volunteers and paid staff, and she would probably single out Russ Morish and the other people who helped her throughout her career. So thank you very much. How many of us would have thought he would have said CIA for culinary, uh, never mind. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we continue now with another fine broadcaster, soon, I think, in his near future, a hall of, future Hall of Famer, a great colleague of mine and a great friend, Nightside and WBZ's Dan Ray. Danny. Thank you so much, Jordan. Uh, First of all, I think that was Saturday Night Live. I don't think that actually was Julia Child. And uh, Richie, I'm stunned. Disco is dead? Why'd you tell me? I mean, I still have it. Anyway, uh, I am uh, very honored today to um, present a, a former colleague of mine, uh, Lavelle Diet. I have uh, first met Lavelle, I guess, 40 years ago. A lot of 40 years uh, have been mentioned uh, today uh, when he and I both were doing uh, weekend talk shows on WBZ Radio. I was a um, law student still at Boston University Law School and kind of getting into the business. Lavelle, uh, he had worked in Washington for many years and uh, was breaking in in Boston at a very difficult time for the city. And uh, there were issues back then. Uh, certainly busing was a huge issue. Uh, Lavelle and I sometimes disagreed on issues and court opinions but we never had a harsh word with one another. Absolutely one of the kindest, most generous uh, and gentle people that I've ever met in the broadcast industry. Uh, Lavelle was a pioneer. There are some other pioneers in the audience tonight. Charlie Austin, Sarah Ann Shaw, Jim Boyd. 
uh, and others who perhaps I haven't mentioned, but Lavelle was a pioneer. He had that wonderful, very, very deep voice that Jordan might imitate, but I will not even attempt to imitate. He had that uh, wonderful ability with words. Uh, he was brought up, as I suspect all of you know, uh, in Florida. So he came to Boston uh, as an outsider, but he quickly became a great insider in this city. And of course, he always reminded us at the end of every one of his programs uh, that use your time wisely because it's really only the money you have. I think all of us are using our time wisely here, uh, recognizing the great achievements of all of the inductees today. And of course, Lavelle would end his program always, always by telling us that um, he loved us madly. Uh, Lavelle would have turned 80 years old next week. So I know somewhere, somewhere, Lavelle is watching, and I know that in his heart he is again reminding us that he loved us madly. We all loved Lavelle. If you knew Lavelle, you had to love him madly. Uh, Lavelle, wherever you are, happy 80th birthday next week. And here's a little bit of a reminder of the great Lavelle diet uh, that my boss, Peter Casey, has provided uh, for this event. So congratulations to Lavelle, to his daughter, Lydia, who is here, who will accept the award in his honor. But it's my honor to present uh, one final time my friend, Lavelle Diet. Good evening to you. It's five minutes past six o'clock. Welcome to the Lavelle Diet Program. We'll be with you until 10 o'clock. We'll be looking ahead more so than looking behind. Seven o'clock, we'll be talking with Jerry Thompson about his experiences being in the Ku Klux Klan. I've had a really good time. Thank you for the time we've been together. I will miss you. You will be missed. That is not an idle phrase in your case. I congratulate you and I thank you for the service. WBZ News Radio 1030. I am Lavelle Diet. Spend your time wisely. It's better than money. And remember, as Duke Ellington always says, I love you. I love you madly. Good night. And uh, Lydia, Lavelle's daughter, would you come forward, please, to accept the award? There you are. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to really thank the Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame for this honor. Um, there are many people in the audience who I've known in various stages of my life, running around in pajamas and WBZ, all the way through hearing my escapades um, as I grew up here in Massachusetts. For those of you that know him, my father was a driven man. Um, in all of my memories, it seems appropriate to sum him up with attributes. Um, history, he was a big history buff. Obviously, journalism, stories of leaders. I was regaled with much family lore. He was about competition. He was about winning. He loved the thrill of the chase, getting that big story, making sure he made waves everywhere he went. Excellent in all things. Anyone who knows him knows that everything to be great. I was always told about how he, we should always run away from mediocrity. And then there were higher powers. He was a son of a priest. He knew and read a lot about religion, the Bible, the Torah, the Quran. But recognition, recognition he didn't have as <clears throat> much as he might have wanted or might have seen for all of his works. But his work spoke for him more than he probably had the opportunity to speak for himself. So <clears throat> he wanted to please and make contributions to the world, and I think you really would appreciate this recognition for his contributions. So I thank you, and have a great afternoon. I worked with Lavelle as well for many, many years, and uh, he was so magnanimous and so amazing that he had his own zip code and area code. I didn't realize that. Huh? 254 617's my area code to town. That's the way he said it. Had to do that for you, Dan. Our next presenter uh, is a legend in his own right. He is such a respected morning man, and now he's a morning man without having to get up that early. Still heard on WBZ, still loved and respected, Gary LaPierre. <laughs> <laughs> 
Boy, you follow Lavelle, and you sound like Florence Nightingale, for God's sakes. <laughs> Woo. Well, Jordan Rich, yes. thank you very much for the kind words. To my fellow broadcasters, great to be here again. It was a huge honor for me to be inducted to the Hall of Fame, class of 2010. But it is equally an honor to be asked to assist in the induction of Dr. Murray Feingold. The list of Kudos, the accolades, the credentials from the medical world for this man I know as Dr. Murray would take the rest of the afternoon to enumerate. And I've been asked to do a 20-minute lecture on what a 30 really is. <laughs> After graduation from Jem Jefferson Medical School, now Thomas Jefferson University, he has done it all. Faculty at Tufts School of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, BU School of Medicine, he founded and for decades has led the Genesis Fund, mentioned earlier a charity dedicated to helping children with birth defects, mental retardation, and genetic diseases. He has published close to 200 medical articles, has written two books, has described three genetic syndromes. One bears his name, the Feingold Syndrome. I'd tell you what it was, but the words about that long, I, I wouldn't even try it. Still writes a weekly newspaper column, is somewhere in the midst of this incredible medical career. The good doctor and Mrs. Feingold had time to have three children. How many grandchildren now, Doc? Six? One here? Somebody mentioned that the age group went in this room for, from 18 months to 100. One month, right? I'm gonna start early. Then there's Dr. Murray, the broadcaster, and I'm extremely proud to have been a colleague of Murray Feingold, the broadcaster for his entire 40-year career, both radio and television. The doctor has been part of CBS Boston, WBZ family for more than 40 years. He's still going strong. Every morning at BZ Radio, including weekends, he's the first to answer the call when the news department needs to have an expert to comment on some medical story. Always part of the family, an intimate part of the family, and that's really an understatement when it comes to Murray Feingold. I, I remember once stopping him in the hallway and said, hey, Doc, I got this awful pain right here. What do you think it is? And he said, don't bother me right now. Jack Williams wants to interview me. <laughs> Family. Dr. Feingold is a pioneer in both fields of medicine and broadcasting. He was the first physician in New England to utilize the television medium to help educate the public regarding health and medical issues. He has received the New England Chapter Award National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences for outstanding in-depth reporting. The list goes on and on. But I'm just told that I just ran out of medical minutes. <laughs> Remembering their own experience, oh, sure. parents know that the transition from summer vacation to starting school may be difficult for their child. During the summer, a youngster's life is filled with many fun things to do, less structure, more hours of sleep, and less exposure to pressure and stress. The ringing of the school bell changes much of this pleasant lifestyle. These changes may have a psychological impact on the child. It's a time when parents need to observe their children closely and be more supportive. Returning to school adds to our already existing angst. I'm Dr. Murray Feingold, and this is a WBZ Medical Minute. My good friend and colleague, Dr. Murray Feingold. Got a hand to hold this? I'll leave it hand. I'll get to keep it. <laughs> Thank you all. June 16, 2014, was the day the winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine was to be announced. Leif Johansson from Sweden was calling the winner at 2 p.m. I anxiously waited that phone call. At 2.02, the phone rang. I excitedly picked up the receiver explaining, is this Leif Johansson from Sweden? No, after a long silence, I heard, it's Don Kelly from Boston. 
you are going to be inducted into the Massachusetts Broadcasters <laughs> Hall of Fame. A wave of euphoria passed over me. The Nobel Prize pales in comparison to the prestigious Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame. It's the pinnacle of success. I'm humbled and very appreciative to receive this honor. It was serendipity, not talent, that was responsible for me becoming a broadcaster. As a young physician, I was on a mission to educate women that their chances of having a Down syndrome child significantly increase as they become reproductively older. I spent hours discussing this subject with small groups of women. Then I was invited to appear on television. During the 1970s, it was unusual for physicians to be on TV. After the interview, Rosemary Van Camp, remember that name, casually mentioned that over 100,000 people heard my comments. I knew then that the best place to provide health education was through the media. Hopefully, Dr. Tim Johnson, myself, and those who have followed have successfully accomplished this goal. Being in the media has added a new dimension to my life, being able to establish the Genesis Foundation for children. There are many people to thank, starting with my family, my wife of 50 years, Lorinda, my three children, <laughs> and their wonderful spouses, and the newest Feingold, sitting over there, right there he is, Tyler Murray Feingold. Oh. I'm really a pediatrician, so I love it. All too often, we take family for granted. Years ago, I was on the David Brednoy show answering health-related questions. A woman caller asks, since I was so busy, did I spend much time with my family? Well, I danced around the question and told her I spent quality time with my family. Well. When I returned home, I was greeted by my six-year-old son. He listened to the program and said, Daddy, do you remember the lady who asked you about your family? I said, yes. He then looked at me with his big brown eyes and replied, Daddy, that was mommy who called. <laughs> A family wake-up call. <laughs> I want to thank my WBZ radio and television family, where I spent 42 of my 45 years in broadcasting, to Peter Casey for continuing to support the Medical Minute, and I'm not going to say Medical Minute. <laughs> and thanks to all my broadcaster friends, and my friends Brian McLaughlin, who came here to join us, I want to thank you all it's been very, very humbling. Thank you. We continue. She's here. She's now. She's WBUR's star. Here she is, Robin Young. Hi, everybody. Um, I think we can all agree that when the then called WNEV Channel 7 launched in the 1980s, it was a very weird time <laughs> in broadcasting in Boston. But one of the wonderful things to come of that was a young reporter named Hank Philippi came to town. She was born in Indianapolis, but we thought she was the most exotic creature we had ever seen. Even her name was exciting. Hank! It was like an exclamation point. And then we learned she'd worked at Rolling Stone magazine on Capitol Hill as legislative assistant for the Senate Judiciary Committee. She was a pioneering woman, uh, a radio reporter at WIBC in 1971 when she was just nine. 
kidding. But very young, and one of the first women in radio. Before coming to Boston, she'd done reporting and anchoring, and once here, she grew to be one of the most ferocious investigative reporters in the country. Her investigation into the 911 system proved emergency responses were being sent to wrong addresses. She got that changed. She uncovered why there was not one person of color on a federal jury pool in Massachusetts. That's now been changed. She got millions of dollars in backup and equipment for firefighters here in Massachusetts and millions, millions in refunds and restitutions for consumers, all without getting a hair out of place. Cool, clear-eyed, you could almost see her blow out her microphone before she'd pocket it in her holster. She won 28, 28 Emmy Awards, 12 Edward R. Murrow Awards, and that would be enough for most of us. But this no-nonsense reporter had an inner, inner femme fatale uh, that just had to get out. She became a mystery writer. Her first novel, Prime Time, featured a Boston investigative reporter named Charlotte Charlie McNally. Hmm, sounds like Hank Phillippe Ryan. It won the Agathy Award for Best First Novel in 2007. She'd go on to win the Best Mystery Agathy Award in 2009, the Mary Higgins Clark Award just last year. She now teaches others as co-founder of the Mystery Writers of America University. It's a low-cost, full-day writing seminar. I think she's headed out tonight to conduct it. It helps others get their ideas down on paper. Now, none of these incredible achievements would matter if Hank wasn't also a great colleague. You know, I'm reminded I was honored to be here myself a couple of years ago, honored to be inducted. And at the time, I was thinking of things as you do, of all the things that have happened over the years. And I, was, I remembered a moment when I was directing at TV 38. I was a child, and I was second directing a Red Sox game. And right next to me, the sound guy, equally young, it was his first day, and he completely froze on the soundboard. I mean, we had to peel his hands off the soundboard. He was so frightened. And our eyes met. And I know all of you in, that room have, in this room have had that experience where you were in the foxhole with someone, and you never forget it. And I didn't mention it because I thought, oh, you know, we don't have time, uh, uh, and that's really such a small thing. Well, you know what, he came, he was here, 40 years after that moment that we were together in the foxhole. And I mention this because this day isn't about just recognizing these extraordinary individual achievements. It's about honoring those who make this what this is, a broadcasting community. And I know someone who would be here, if he could, for Hank. Someone who thought the sun uh, rose and set with her, excuse me, the late, great Marty Sender, who was her best friend, and I know, Hank, that you've asked me to be here because this is the closest you're going to get, but I know he would be standing here if he was with us, so I stand in for him and everybody who had a chance to work with Hank Philly Ryan, Hank Philippi Ryan. Let's remember why. <laughs> starts with your tip. This is a rat in somebody's apartment. Your call to the one reporter who can expose what others don't want you to know. Right now, is anyone required to inspect these places? Hank Philippi Ryan. What was going on? Can you believe you're saying this? The most important investigations start with you. If you have a tip, tell Hank. 855-247-HANK or tell Hank at whdh.com. Hank investigates only on 7 News. No miscreant is safe. Hank Philippi Ryan. Thank you so much. I saw everybody get out their cells, cell phones. When the phone number came up, I'm not there, but you'll take a message and I will call you right back. I promise, I promise I will. Thank you so much, Robin. You always make me cry when they called to tell me that I was going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. They asked me to tell them someone to introduce me. Think of someone who you revere, they said. And the, that was instantly Robin Young, who was the role model for curiosity, for intelligence, for journalism, for grace, for reinvention, for growth, for innovation, for creativity. So thank you, you're quite, quite perfect. And Thank you so much um, 
for this. This is very moving uh, and quite a joy, and it is such a treat to see you all, all of my colleagues. You know, I never planned to be a reporter. When I was a little kid, I would say to my mom, I would gripe, as we all do, it isn't fair, mom. The world isn't fair. It isn't fair. And my mom, as only she could say, would say, get over it, kid. Just get over it. And I think just to prove my mom wrong, I decided that what I would try to do was make the world a little more fair, to make it be a better place, to have it matter that my life had existed, to have it matter that I had been here on this planet. So when I got out of college, I decided that in order to change the world, I would go into politics. I mean, OK, I was 20. I was naive, like that was going to work. So I worked in many political campaigns, several political campaigns back home in Indiana. Um, sadly, not one candidate I ever worked for actually won. <laughs> and that's one of those times when you think the universe is speaking to you. And it is saying, find another career. So in 1971, I went to the biggest radio station in Indianapolis and talked to the news director. And I said, I'm here to apply for a job as a reporter. So this news director, who I remember being kind of like um, Lou Grant, jangling his keys in his pocket, jingle, 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 because was, everything was moving so fast. He says, why should I hire you? You know, do, you're an English major. Do you have any experience? I'm like, uh, no. He said, have you ever done an interview? Have you ever been on radio? Have you ever been on television? Have you ever written a news article? Have you ever done anything like that? I, no. He said, um, did you take journalism in college? Mm, no. Were you on the school newspaper or the yearbook? Uh, no. Um, did, when you were little, did you hand out a newspaper in your neighborhood that you, that you wrote? Uh, I, got, I got nothing. And I saw this job that I really wanted just evaporating. So I said to him, um, sir, you know, I really want this job as a reporter. I grew up here in Indianapolis, and I... I know where all the streets are, because <laughs> you kind of have to go with what you've got. And then I said to him, and you know, your license is up for renewal at the FCC, and you don't have any women working here. <laughs> and then I just smiled, and the next day I had my first job in broadcasting. <laughs> Two fast things about that, and I love to tell the story of journalism classes, because it won't work anymore. If I walked into Channel 7 now and said, you should hire me because I'm a woman, they would say, you and everybody else in this building, sister. You know, my boss is a woman, and her boss is a woman, and I am very grateful for it. Um, but I am proud to be among the women who sort of broke the gender barrier in broadcasting. Nancy Dickerson and Barbara Walters and Leslie Savage and Leslie Stahl and, Les and Jessica Savage and Jane Pauley and all those people we started, they gave us our jobs because they had to. And we kept them because we loved it. You know, I'm so proud. Now I've wired myself with hidden cameras. I've confronted corrupt politicians. I've chased on criminals. I've gone undercover and in disguise. And I have loved every minute of it. To work with these incredibly talented people, my producer, Mary Schwager, is here. I've worked, we have worked together for 13 years. Is that right? 15. We've worked together for 15 years. Um, and that's a Hall of Fame category right there, you, ha you have to admit. Um, and Linda Mealy, my news director, and Chris is here, and Mike and Teddy, and Bubba, and Adam, and uh, Mike, and it's table one, it rocks. And my darling Jonathan, my husband, um, who is a Hall of Famer on his own, Jonathan Shapiro. Um, when I was a kid, I used to ask my mom more questions. And the main one was why. Why, 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 why? And my mother's answer always was, go and find out. Ask the questions for yourself. See what you can discover. And after 40 years as a reporter, that is what I still love to do every day. I love to ask why. I love to go find out. I love to go out and discover. You have made such a difference in my life. And when in interviews, people always ask me, what's the best story you've ever done? And I say, that story is still to come. Thank you very much for inviting me.
meet the author. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a few more uh, honorees to be inducted, so I'm going to ask the presenters to be as tight as they possibly can for time. My next uh, presenter is a good friend, a neighbor of mine, in fact. See him mowing his lawn occasionally, but today he's got an honor to present. Here is Magic 106.7's David O'Leary. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, it is, uh, of course, a pleasure and a real honor to be among so many friends and colleagues uh, from, uh, from broadcasting today. So congratulations to all the inductees, uh, especially Mike Adams, uh, whose morning show I had the honor of stepping into about a year ago. So congratulations to Mike, but to all the inductees. I have known John Garabedian for over 35 years. I've worked for and with John at WGTR in Natick, WGTF on Nantucket, Radio Craft, Super Radio, V66, WBC on the Rock of Boston, and KISS 108, and a few other uh, projects and endeavors along the way. As a broadcaster, a true broadcaster for more than 50 years, John is what many of us in radio and television can only aspire to. He is the whole package. He does it all. He's an on-air talent with few peers, he possesses an incredible sense of programming. He's made his mark in station management as a general manager in both radio and in television. As a salesperson, he and Arnie uh, traipsed around and raised the venture capital to put V66 on the air. Uh, even in engineering, the technical area, which is an area which many on-air people, you know, in which they fear to tread, John is a one-person department. While many of us, anybody have one of these cards, the, the radio telephone thing that you filled out the the form for, or maybe you go back and you, you took your third class license test at the customs house or something like that. John had his first class radio telephone license at the age of 17, which is remarkable. In fact, just one quick story, at WGTF, which was the 3,000 watt FM station uh, where we worked together on Nantucket, John was not only the guy on the air, he was the guy who tuned up the station's transmitter. He was also the guy who negotiated the lease with the FAA for the tower space. He wrote the brief to petition the FCC to move the frequency from Harwich to Nantucket in the first place and literally flew the airplane over to the island with all the station uh, auto automation equipment in the plane to uh, install and get the station on the air. He really did it all and still does after creating and spending 20 plus years hosting the nationally syndicated open house party for over 100 affiliates uh, coast to coast. In 2012, John went back to local radio broadcasting. He bought two stations on Cape Cod. He soon added two more, uh, which he operates while staying at one of his modest homes in Falmouth. The one with the hangar in the runway. The other one with the hangar in the runway. Engineering, on-air talent, promotion programming, flight director or pilot for your traffic reports. In any area of our industry, you'd need to look long and hard to find someone with higher standards for the work that we do and for what we can accomplish as broadcasters. I'm thrilled to have worked with him so closely for so many years and very, very proud to call him one of my best friends, John Garabedian. Let's take a look. The biggest thrill was getting the station on the air, and then within 60 days, the station just blew its way right into Boston, and everybody loved it. Hi there. Who's this? This is Jeff. Hello, Jeff. What do you want to hear? I want to hear Champagne Supernova from Oasis. Oh, how about every last drop of the song, all seven and a half minutes? Please. <laughs> what did you do last night? I, uh, I swapped the line. Oh. Well, I hope tonight you won't. Uh, not at all. You're... I'm listening to Open House Party. That's it. Fully rested, ready for action. Thanks for calling Open House Party. Thank you very much. Um, it's certainly an honor to be here. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this whole group. Uh, being inducted to the Hall of Fame is certainly great recognition. But the most wonderful thing is being part of this great family of broadcasting in Massachusetts. Um, and seeing so many people that 
you know, I've spent my entire life with it. It really is family. Uh, David Mugar and I went to uh, Belmont Hill School. He used to sit behind me in English. Uh, Gary LaPierre, uh, back when I was 19 years old doing afternoon drive in Dover, New Hampshire, was my newsman. And Gary, I don't think I ever told you this, but I was jealous because you had a beautiful 57 Chevy convertible, bright red. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> um, also, I want to throw in just one little thing. Uh, Leo Baranek, who I worship as a manager, as a great broadcaster and a great man, uh, did another thing in his career. He had a day job. He was a partner in an organization called Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. And he is one of the world experts on acoustics and tuned in a majority of the great concert halls in the world. But the other thing that Bolt, Baranek, and Newman did was under a contract from the Department of Defense who was worried about what a nuclear strike might do to communications in the United States when big cities would be wiped out, invented a thing called the ARPANET. And the ARPANET evolved into the internet. So salute to Dr. Baranek for that. As we go through life and become who we are, we are all shaped by the people in our lives and by people who aren't in our lives. And I really thought today, what am I going to talk about? I don't want to talk about me. I do that enough. But having gratitude and appreciation for lots of people and uh, the people who got me to where I am. I remember when I was a kid, I was, I think it was uh, freshman year, was probably the spring of 1956. It was a beautiful Spring day, the sun is shining, blue sky, I got off the school bus at Weston High School, walked in, and I'm walking down to my locker, and someone said, hey, Arnie Ginsberg mentioned Weston High School last night on the radio. I said, who's Arnie Ginsberg? <laughs> Two years later, a classmate of mine and I made a record. And we called Arnie Ginsberg and said, uh, we have this record, can we play it for you? Will you play it on your show? He said, well, bring it in, let me hear it in the afternoon. So we drove into Brookline, to the WBOS studio on Com Ave, which is now the Mass Turnpike. And he said, all right, come back tonight around 9.30. I said, well, how do we get in? He said, oh, the door will be open. So we showed up at this kind of dirty place, and we went up the stairs, and I think the, uh, you know, the Polish hour or the Irish show or the Armenian hour, whatever it was, was, was ending. And Arnie was there, come on in. And he put us on the air, and he played our song. And Ed talked to us. It was the first time I was ever on the radio. And never did I envision that many years later he'd become a good friend and my business partner as we started V66 together, and he's been a great influence on my life. In 1972, we put a brand new radio station on the air in Metro West and hired a young guy named Craig Howard. Craig had just gotten out of the service. He was a Green Beret in Vietnam. He'd been a medic, and that's a tough job. Uh, Craig also had been under the Agent Orange Syndrome. The pock marks on the face, uh, mood swings, uh, depression, different things. But he was a great guy, really great guy. Unfortunately, he died young at 43, uh, perhaps from the Agent Orange stuff. But Craig used to have some great sayings, and everything was a saying and a slogan. What happens to you, you let happen to you. That was my second favorite. His favorite, my favorite of all his sayings was, um, every misfortune is a fortune in disguise. And life is like that. When, th when God gives you lemons, make lemonade. And so through my life, I've always thought of some of these sayings and tried to live that way. And one of the greatest misfortunes in the history of my life started over 100 years ago when the Turks massacred the Armenians, starting in the late 1800s. My grandfather moved to, out of Armenia, came to America, moved into Cambridge. Uh, about 15 years later, 1908, my mother's father moved to, uh, left Armenia and came to Malden. And they met and they had a family and my two sisters were born, and I was born. And our mother, uh, who had this background, didn't get her citizenship until the 1940s, always brought us up to believe America is the greatest country on earth, that you can do anything here, 
You can be whoever you want to be. Take advantage of it. She also taught us a lot of other lessons in life. She was a wonderful person. I've said many times I was lucky to know her, let alone have her be my mother. But she taught us, simplify your life, be happy. Nothing's more important than being happy. Nothing. You want money? No. You want to be happy. Money's what makes you happy. You want power? No. You want to be happy. Power's what makes you happy. But does it really make you happy? So pursuing your career and doing what you love, which I think most of us in broadcasting have all done, we're very lucky, uh, brings me to a poem by Robert Frost, Two Tramps in Mud Time. Three lines from that poem. My object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation as my two eyes make one in sight. Do what you love in life. About 40 years ago, I thought, I'm in a position where I can sprinkle the world with some kind of goodness by just putting a message out all the time, and over the years, it might have some effect. So I started signing off my show on radio, on TV, still on my show on Saturday night on the Open House Party. And the saying is this, and I leave you with it. Learn from yesterday, live for today, dream for tomorrow. But most important, be your dream. Thank you. Next, we'd like to call up Ann Sweeney from WGBH Television to present our next award. Ann. Hi there. It is such an honor to be in a room filled with so many people that I have um, respected and uh, wanted to emulate for so long. So it's an honor to be here representing WGBH also as the Broadcasters Hall of Fame pays tribute to the late, great David Ives. David's career at WGBH lasted 40 years, and his leadership, his warmth, and his creative spirit continue to inspire all of us today. He combined the best of that Yankee character with some pretty wild showmanship and a great sense of humor, but also with the journalistic integrity that was born of his pre-WGBH days when he was a Wall Street Journal reporter, an editor and bureau chief, and an editorial writer for WBZ TV and radio. David came to WGBH in 1960 as the Director of Development before rising up to President and then the Chair of the Board of, of Trustees. Now, he not only manned the helm at WGBH, but he also went on air. He went on camera and he inspired people to give money to public broadcasting in a way that nobody had done before. He inspired viewers to bid, bid, bid during the WGBH auction which was this really wild and crazy event that he invented in 1966. It was a little bit like Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland teaming up and let's make a show. He made us want to do it together. It was David also, who also established WGBH as a major force in the public television and radio systems. He oversaw the creation of programs that continue to raise the bar for American television. Nova, Frontline, Masterpiece, Evening at Pops, how-to programs from Julia Child's cooking shows to This Old House and the Victory Garden. His leadership also assured a place for programs like La Plaza and Say Brother, now Basic Black. And on radio, The Spider's Web and Morning Pro Musica became known and loved by people far from Boston. Here is a clip that captures the unique flavor of David Ives, See if you recognize anybody in it. This is the station to watch, folks. This is your own channel, too. So send us your kind contribution. Help keep your station in view. Help keep your station in view. Folks, help keep the wolf from our door. Send us your kind contribution to Boston 02134. There's 
Robert J. Accepting the award is Edie Baker. Edie? Thank you. Well, that was David Ives, the president of Channel 2, who not only sang songs, but made them up too. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Edie Baker. And for many years, I had the honor of managing the WGBH Channel 2 auction. A lot of you were on, I know. And one of the special joys that came with that post was working closely with David. And behind that bow tie and the reserved demeanor, David was a showman and willing to do anything to support WGBH. Now off camera, David was a leader who cared about WGBH employees and he knew the importance of supporting them. He always acknowledged our work. And being the journalist he was, he always did it in writing. He had a famed ancient underwriter typewriter and after a broadcast, a good meeting presentation, or even a minor task vigorously accomplished, he would stop at his desk, grab the nearest piece of paper that had any unused blank space on it, he was a thrifty Yankee, and he would roll it into his underwood, dash off a detailed thank you note for a job well done. He would sign it DOI, David O. Ives, and there were hundreds of these DOI notes to employees over the years, and all of us who got them cherish them to this day. Long before Market Basket demonstrated the power of a president who knows and values his workers, David Ives was just that. Now David also was a mentor who trusted us to learn our jobs, perform them well, and then get out of the way and let us do it. Now one day when we wanted to expand the Channel 2 auction to include a lot of cars, my colleague Phil Collier, who many of you remember, and I met, went to meet with Ernie Box Sr. He was a good friend of the station, but would donate a car only once in a while. He was a tough cookie, and he was always pressing us to maximize exposure. So knowing this, we presented him with quite an intensive package, calling it the WGBH New Car Auction, and giving it the same attention and weight on air that we had for the art segments. This was unheard of in the realm of public television at that time, but we knew it would appeal to Ernie. He was surprised and said, does David Ives know you're here? Don't you have to ask him about this? And we said, no. David trusts us to do our job. We knew it was OK, and then we went silent. Ernie looked at us and looked at us. And after what seemed an endless minute, because we forced him to be the first to speak, he said yes. And then later in a presentation that he hosted at WGBH, where he had another dozen car dealers in attendance, he shared his enthusiasm for this most unusual public broadcasting proposal, and by the end of the meeting, we had 10 more cars. That year, we sold 11 cars on the auction because David empowered his people and showed his confidence in us. So it's my privilege to know and work with David, and I'm honored to accept this award on behalf of his WGBH family. We just have a few awards left. Our next presenter is a lovely, lovely lady and a terrific announcer. Mornings at WCRB, a classic in her own right, Laura Carlo. Thank you, Jordan. Jordan and I are also neighbors. That means David O'Leary, you and I are neighbors too. You don't know it. I cannot believe I am in this room with people that I grew up listening to I am a rock and roll girl because of Arnie Woo Woo Ginsburg, Johnny H. Garabedian, and so many others in this room. Congratulations to all the inductees. I am delighted to be part of this gala luncheon, and especially because I have the opportunity to share some of my thoughts about inductee David McNeil, my boss, my friend, and my mentor known to all at WCRB as DMAC. I have written and rewritten these remarks a hundred times. Somewhere around 42 pages, I decided I should start to edit it down. How do I do this man justice? Over two dozen years ago, when I was four, I applied for a job as the morning news anchor at WCRB in Waltham. I got there early for the interview, and I was one of four nervously rereading our resumes in the lobby. Who knows how many others had gone before us? 
It turns out I was the last one that day to be interviewed. And the receptionist said, Dave McNeil would be out to get me in a moment. The Dave McNeil? I just about had a heart attack. I didn't know when you send to a blind box that the interview would be with one of the top voices, in fact, one of the deans of Boston Radio. Out came this tall fellow with long salt and pepper hair, long salt and pepper beard, wearing jeans. At a rock station, he would have just blended in. But this guy was beautifully spoken, smart, courteous, elegant, and I was afraid for just a minute that I would be so in awe of one of the voices that I grew up with that I wouldn't make any sense in that interview. But it was clear he loved news as much as I did. And in a moment, I forgot that I was talking to an icon. He picked my brain, he challenged me, and the 30 minutes he gave to everyone before me became three hours before we realized it. Then he asked me, what do you know about classical music? Come on, I'm, I'm applying for a news job. Oh man, I had piano lessons when I was a kid. I took a music appreciation class at BC. How could I tap dance around this? And I realized I couldn't. How do you tap dance around God? I mean, Dave McNeil. So I just fessed up. Mr. McNeil, the truth is, I worship at the altar of rock. Did I just mess up my chance at this job? No, he said, you just got yourself hired. And I will never forget what he said next because it is burned in my brain. I don't even have to look at my notes. He said, I think a good manager colors outside the lines. I think a bad manager surrounds himself with cookie cutter yes men. I think someone with a wide variety of interests brings more to the table than one trick ponies. I think young lady, you will tell me the truth and you will tell our listeners the truth and that's how we're gonna win the ratings wars. And he hired me on the spot. For 24 years, I had the pleasure and the honor of working for and alongside a man who cared. He cared about the radio station. He also got his first phones when he was about 17. He cared about the station keeping up with the latest technology. In fact, some of you might think that classical music is a dusty, old, conservative format, but we actually were the first station in town to use CDs, and we pioneered a lot of the technologies that are just taken for granted today. That's because more than any other format, classical listeners care about sound and fidelity. DMAC cared about his listeners and we answered every single one who got in touch with us. He cared about the sponsors. He cared about the old music and the exciting young musicians who were performing it. He cared about getting everything right and making sure that we did too. He called it bird-dogging a project. In fact, I heard that damn word every single day for 24 years. He cared enough to set a great example. And if you needed him, he cared enough to become your mentor. But most of all, he cared about his staff, whom he always called his colleagues. He didn't care for personal glory. He was too modest, and he always gave us all the credit. When I was invited to speak on Dave's behalf, I asked our former station secretary to send an email to anybody she could remember on our staff and see if they would contribute to an ad for DMAC. It was a long shot. Several aren't even in broadcasting anymore and several others live and work out of state. No matter how many years it had been since they had seen Dave though, every single one she could reach said yes and the ad is in the book. It's funny, if not outright crazy, how many emailed back the exact same sentiment. Of course I'll contribute. I have never worked for and with a more honorable gentleman, and I probably will never again. And as one other of my colleagues added, Laura, on that Friday, please raise a glass to him for me.
please welcome a true friend of the Boston Symphony and Boston Pops, our host and producer of our live broadcasts of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops Orchestras on WCRB 102.5, Mr. Dave McNeil. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world, there is nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus, thank God he lives and lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, ten times ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. I'll be painfully quick because I'll be drippy otherwise. Um, thank you so much for this honor for our father, Dave McNeil. Um, just to have that audio of him really is assuring. And just the fact that we grew up in radio. We ran around the station like Lydia was saying. You know, We ran around and did crazy things when you got the chance to run around and do crazy things in a radio station. Um, and growing up with V66, we, we appreciated that. And Dad gave us the exposure to radio to appreciate that. And you're such an amazing community in what you offer. He always talked about community. That was his thing, service, service to the community, the public file. What can we do more the, to put in the public file? What, what can we talk about more? Armenia was a big thing for him, too. He, he always had these different shows and things that he was trying to do to, to serve the community and bring people together. And he always had a story, not about himself, but about somebody else that he could bring people together and, and show people what was going on. And um, when he got polio and Bill Sherman first asked him to come into the station when he was 19 years old, his whole world changed. And because his whole world changed, my brothers and I are here today. So we want to thank you too and thank the committee for honoring him with this, with the induction into the Hall of Fame. He would have been mortified um, and very humbled and he would have thanked a lot of other people like Laura and, and Ted Jones and Chris and, uh, and other people that have helped him along the way. Thank you so much. This is the Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame. My next uh, presenter is a member of the board, Mark Vo from Cumulus Worcester. Go Worcester. Come on up here, Mark. It's great to be here. We definitely got it right. Uh, Jordan, you're on the nominating committee, and uh, we definitely got it right this year. I just turned 50, so hold on for one second. There we go. I was five when Dave O'Gara first went on the air. By comparison, Dave was a sophomore in high school when he used to call John Garabedi to win prizes on ORC AM, so you could do the math, but it's certainly great to be here. The last almost 13 years, it's been my pleasure to not only be program director of WORC, but doing afternoons and following Dave O'Gara. He is our connection to the past, to a station that was one of the first in the country to ever play a Beatles record, the first to play Barbara Ann by the Beach Boys, and the first to play The Lion Sleeps Tonight by the Tokens. He's also a vital part of our future at WORC FM 98.9. You can roll the video. Good afternoon, folks. It's Dave O'Gara looking back on this day in Beatles history. Interesting day for John Lennon and Yoko Ono. They met each other for the first time. They did so at an art gallery called the Indica in London on this day, 1966. And on this day, 1971, John and Yoko appeared on ABC's Dick Cavett show. A clip from that show is included in the Tom Hanks movie, Forrest Gump. Your Beatles Spotlight Song of the Day today came from the American album called Beatles 65. The Beatles were huge fans of Carl Perkins, and with Ringo Starr singing lead on this one, here's the Carl Perkins rock and roll classic, Beatles doing Honey Don't on ORC FM. Please welcome my good friend, my colleague, Mr. Dave O'Gara. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, the music's not going to rule under me. Trust me, I want you guys to leave here today saying, I like that guy because he got out under his three minutes. So <laughs> you don't do 45 years of radio without having a lot of love and support along the way. And I certainly got that from the first day I was on the radio in 1969, hired by a guy named Len Talbot that I'm sure John remembered way back when uh, through the present day. Uh, my parents, who unfortunately are no longer with us, would have been the proudest people to be sitting in the room today. 
My mom had an eight track made of one of my first radio shows and you haven't lived till you drove around in her car listening to you introduce a record and having to wait for it to click to the next channel. I mean, that was, those are the good old days. But I'm, I'm from Worcester, better known as the city that taught Tim Murray how to drive. We're the heart of the Commonwealth. We've been described anatomically in other ways, but uh, you know what, I'm proud to be uh, from Worcester, on Worcester Radio, still on Worcester Radio after all these days. I want to thank my family, my daughter Chelsea, my son David Jr. are here today, my friends Gary and Sue from Cumulus Radio, I've got Bob and Steve over there, uh, my son's girlfriend Erica, they're all here to support me today. Couldn't be happier to be here, I'm thrilled to be with the inductees that we have here today. Um, and you talk, my wife Amory over there, 20 years ago this month, I thought my radio career was over. I'd been at WORCAM for 25 years, and I had one of those meetings with the boss who were going in another direction, okay? Some of you had that conversation. I thought my radio career was over, but uh, thanks to the good folks at Cumulus, I'm back on the air. I'm still on the air seven days a week, as a matter of fact, and uh, I would not be here without my wife, so I, I have to throw kudos to her. She's just an un unbelievable lady. And I got to tell you, about five years ago, I got a key to the city from the, from the mayor of Worcester. And today, I feel like I've gotten a key to the Commonwealth. This is fantastic. Thank you very much. That is cool. Native Worcesterite makes good. And he's got a lot of years left. All right, the final award is about to be presented. And then uh, we invite you to stick around and uh, schmooze a little bit. Uh, Two guys who need very little introduction. I'll just introduce the first one as Bob Lobel. Need I say more? Bob? I'll do that one. Okay. Sorry about the crutches. I was riding shotgun with Dave Murray. First time. <laughs> Tim Murray. Now, who am I supposed to introduce now? Some guy oh, named. Yep. I got it. Um, I need a nap. And I have to go to the bathroom. I mean, really, does that make me any different than the rest of you? No. No. Dr. Murray Feingold. Okay, Dr. Murray Feingold had a great uh, influence on my son going to medical school. He's now a cardiologist in Vermont. And if Murray hadn't been in the right place at the right time, who knows? what he would have done. So thank you so very much. And Murray was the first guy I ever heard utter the words, if it lasts longer than four hours, go see a doctor. <laughs> Schwegler, oh my God, Schwegler. I had to sit with 11 Schweglers for lunch today. Eleven Schweglers, Bill. Come on. You know what? I swear he had a dartboard in his office. He'd throw the darts, and if it hit rain, that was it. He said, Bruce, get a friggin' window in your office so you can look out and find out what it's doing. One of the best stories I've heard from short. I didn't hear this. I was there, Matt. I was actually there. He had a, like a Volkswagen Beetle con convertible, right? He drives it in. All of a sudden, in the middle of the afternoon, he, it starts to rain. <laughs> you think, and the top was down. You think he would have put the top up on his convertible because he's a weatherman, for Christ's sake. <laughs> really. I think, you know what? Weather's driving the show. I, think, I would have loved to have been a weatherman more than anything else. I don't know what went wrong. You know, bad career. I, you know, I can't go do it again but I would have loved to have been a weatherman. This guy was a scientist, he still is a scientist. He was in the Navy before he came here. He had no other job on TV. He was able to combine the two things uh, of science and television. It's just like, like sports and television. These are like two separate bodies of knowledge to, to bring together. Schwegler could do it like nobody else. Yeah, he was a pain in the ass, a lot. <laughs> yeah, but in a really good way. He was a speed skater in Wisconsin. I don't know. I don't believe that. He said he was. I didn't. But uh, you know what? Now that I figured out who I was supposed to introduce, I better do it. Bruce Schwegler from Channel 4. The weather can be hard on all of us here in New England. But there's more to weather than just the temperature. When the mercury goes down, the heating bills go up. 
That's why it's important to put a little Yankee ingenuity to work, using the best of the old, like this wood-burning stove, and learning to use new ideas, like these solar panels. New England weather can be great, and I look forward to forecasting those kinds of days. But if I can find ways to make this winter a little bit easier on you and your pocketbook, I'll tell you about that, too. Between you and that uh, video, man, I, I don't know whether I'm coming or going, but I'll tell you one thing, I'm going to be going in a little while. I'm not going to take up 15, 20 minutes of your time. We're going to go with a three or four minute uh, window, and I think that's going to be enough to cover it. I'm thrilled to be here. I appreciate the invitation. And I can positively attest to the many aspects of a lengthy career. Well, actually, I think today has beaten that. Uh, it's run a long time. <laughs> Thank you for that Hall of Fame nomination, and congratulations to all who have joined me in this humbling experience. It started in Alaska in 1965 when Naval Ensign Schwegler, who donned a pair of windshield wiper glasses for a TV weather briefing. That was a segment that was aimed at squadrons from Anchorage all the way out to off Russia. There was stormy weather throughout. It was going to last for a week. It demanded a light note, and I provided it. The admirals and pilots loved it. My boss, the captain, hated it and wanted to kill me. So I spent the rest of the night uh, hidden in the officers' club. And uh, that worked great because we had all the king crab we could eat, and I really enjoyed that. Two more years in Florida with ship and aircraft operations plus hurricane hunter work. These patrols heralded new horizons for me. Lieutenant Schwegler was civilian bound. Met a New England broadcast icon down in Florida. You may know him. It was Don Kent. He was at the National Weathercasters Convention in Tampa. And my radio and TV game then became underway. Job offers stacked up as the growing broadcast industry found only a few newly qualified meteorologists. They're all, the rest were song and dance men and ladies. Mr. Kent was intent that I choose WBZ in Boston, the only big city I had never visited. <laughs> Within a month I did and garnered 33 WBZ broadcasting years and one hell of a great time. Now, with another 13 years under my belt, boating and skiing, hiking, golf, and biking, plus work on the house, yard, and lake, I say thank you all so dearly for my near half century of pleasures. Even more than that, kudos to my wonderful family, right over there and referred to already. I will go through them again. Despite steamy downpours, frigid whiteouts, and wavering trees, power lines, and surf, they were there for me. Barbara, my wife of 41 years. Ah. <laughs> I learned how to growl. It started it all a few years earlier when I chased the attractive new London co-ed through WBZ. She was there to interview Tom Ellis for a graduate school report. She was at uh, BC. I cut her off at the pass. <laughs> or should I say, I threw a pass <laughs> at her. It worked. And so far, we've lived happily, mostly, ever after. Two wonderful kids, Matthew and Melinda, followed. They're sitting at the table, too. In a five-year spread, Matt is an expert. He's an expert with thermal imaging technologies, and he represents a top worldwide corporation. And the veterinarian in the group is sitting right there as well. My lovely daughter, Melinda, Dr. Schwegler. She examines and surgically resolves all sorts of animal physical and health issues, even some of mine. 
because I've been accused of being an animal from time to time. <laughs> Both have fabulous spouses, uh, one who is here and one who made it for the door, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, the fabulous spouses are Hillary and Brian. And we have intelligent grandchildren with us as well, all very young. We have Ava, Grace, and Annabelle. Where is Annabelle? She's gone with the boss, isn't she? She's very young. This has been a long time since I crossed the Worcester Hills on Interstate 90 in my Volkswagen Beetle. It was filled with all I owned, plus images of the future I was heading to. Then and now, I wish all of you fair winds and following seas. That's an oath in the US military, the US Marines and Navy. Fair winds and following seas. I hope that continues for many years for all of us. Thank you. And with that, we bid you a fond adieu, except to say that massbroadcasters.hof.org will be where you can make your nominations and catch a download of this broadcast. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you.